All right, so this is just a little snippet on hepatitis, learning how to differentiate uh, the uh, different major types of hepatitis and, and what we're going to do about them. So the liver is responsible for more than 500 functions in the body. So when things go wrong with the liver, um, a lot goes wrong with the liver. And you can see a lot of this with hepatitis. You know, So some of the problems you can have is hepatitis. And if you remember itis, it's inflammation. Um, cirrhosis, which is um, you know more of like a chronic liver failure where there's actual um, breakdown of the uh hepatocytes or the t the cells that are within the liver and there's kind of like a scarring formation um, over the liver and then there's acute liver failure where you know something happens uh, more rapidly um, compared to cirrhosis um, like someone has a Tylenol overdose um, something like that um, and um, leading to you know acute liver failure but all all of these as a whole will end up with the same and similar problems that you know the these 500 vitamins functions, a lot of them uh, start to deteriorate. So this PowerPoint is really going to focus on hepatitis. So when you're looking at hepatitis, again, it's itis, so think inflammation. Um, it's an inflammation of the liver. Um, usually it's from a viral cause, but it can also be caused from alcohol, medications, chemicals, autoimmune disorders. Um, and hepatitis can lead to that um, uh, acute liver failure uh, or um, chronic liver disease, uh, things like the cirrhosis and things that we were talking about. So how many hepatitises are there? Well, there's many, but we're going to focus on um, A, B, and C today because those are the most common ones that you're going to see in practice. So if you're looking at hepatitis A, um, one way you can remember this is A for anal. So it's transmitted in the fecal oral route. Um, and you know why is this? Why would someone be um, transmitting this? Because remember, it's it's a virus. How would it be transferred? Um, well, if people are living in crowded living conditions, have poor hygiene, poor sanitation in general, um, or if there's contaminated food or water. So this happens a lot in um, areas where they don't have very clean water. And the good thing, though, is with hepatitis A is there is a vaccine. Let's look at hepatitis B now. So you can remember B for blood because it's transmitted through the blood or uh, through the body, aka sexual contact. Um, and this would happen in people that are using contaminated needles, syringes, or blood products that are contaminated. Um, if someone else is infected and someone has sexual activity with them, it can put them at risk for getting it. Um, and then also tattoos and body piercings. If the um, uh, you know devices that are used to give uh, tattoos or body piercings are not properly um, cleaned, it can put you at risk for hepatitis B. Um, and people with hepatitis B uh, can be infectious for life if they're a carrier. Uh, but the good news is, is that there is, again, a vaccine. You'll see here, hepatitis C is going to seem really similar to hepatitis B, and it is. Um, but I remember C for contact or C for cirrhosis. So it's going to have those same reasons or causes. You know, a lot of times this is going to be people that are chronic drug users, um, having uh, sexual activity uh, with each other, um, you know, unprotected, which can put them at risk for hepatitis C, um, or getting those tattoo or body piercings um, with places that do not maybe have the best um, sterilization procedure for their equipment. Um, so it, the, the, a little bit of the differences um, with, with hepatitis C is that C usually will progress to cirrhosis. So uh, most people with hepatitis C develop, you know, chronic hep C, remain infectious, and have a lot of liver disease. So um, a lot of people can um, recover from hepatitis B and not necessarily have chronic um, liver damage, whereas with hepatitis C, you're going to see more of that, um, you know, uh, chronic uh, problems with the liver. Um, and the other big difference is that there's no vaccine for hepatitis C. So signs and symptoms, if they um, have acute hepatitis, they could have no symptoms. Um, but if they did, they're going to be symptoms um, like hepatomegaly, which is that you know enlargement or swelling of the liver. Um, they can have nausea, vomiting, um, right upper quadrant tenderness, because uh, of course that's where the liver is. Um, they can have weight loss and anorexia issues. 
um, poor appetite, um, generally fatigue, flu-like symptoms are probably one of the most common things you'll see in these patients, um, and then jaundice. So, uh, and if you remember where we see jaundice, jaundice is that yellowing. We can have it in the sclera, what they call scleral icterus, um, or it can be in the skin in general. Um, but as a whole, you know, the, you know, usually the acute signs, if people do have symptoms are going to be, you know, kind of those generalized flu symptoms. Um, they can have some jaundice and a lot of those GI symptoms. Um, once it, uh, hepatitis becomes chronic, then we look more at them having signs of um, liver failure in general. So, you know, ascites, the styxeris, the hepatic encephalopathy, bleeding, you know, all the signs that the liver itself is failing, um, that those really important, remember all those 500 functions we talk about start to go downhill. So the list for chronic could go on and on and on because there's so many functions of the liver. Um, but as a whole, you know, acute is more of the generalized symptoms, GI and flu and jaundice, whereas the chronic is going to be a lot more of those, um, you know, that the liver itself is not working. So, um, you know, kind of like the fluid imbalances, um, the bleeding risk, the poor nutrition, all of those uh, more chronic um, manifestations. Believe it or not, there is more than one way to be yellow. So um, looking at the different types of um, jaundice, um, there's hemolytic, hepatocellular, and obstructive. Um, and so when I'm looking at hemolytic, you know, that I'm yellow because I'm breaking down too many red blood cells. Because one of the um, waste products of red blood cells is unconjugated bilirubin, which is just, a, like I said, a waste product. So pretty much um, for hemolytic jaundice, that's because they have um, too much that they're trying to break down and the liver just can't keep up. Um, if the liver itself isn't working problem, there's a problem within the cell of the liver, then it's hepatocellular, makes sense, right? So this is where um, the liver's not functioning itself, so it's not able to conjugate the bilirubin or process it or excrete it. Um, so therefore you end up having too much. Um, and then there's also obstructive, which is just as it sounds that, you know, the person's yellow because there's a problem with the flow. And usually it's a problem in the bile duct um, and um, there's either decreased flow or completely obstructed flow leading to that um, backup of that product of the, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, um, that they're having um, too much of that unconjugated bilirubin and um, end up being yellow. Looking at hepatitis labs, sometimes these can get really confusing, um, but it's the only way that we tell one type of hepatitis from another. So um, in hepatitis A, you can look at the IgM or the IgG, um, and you think IgM, think I have hepatitis in this moment, like right now, um, whereas hepat um, IgG, um, my hepatitis is gone, or I'm good because I'm immunized. So G is good, immunized, or the hepatitis is gone. So it might be that you have received a vaccination and so you are immune to it, or you could have had hepatitis at some point, but now you no longer have an active infection. I'm looking at hepatitis B. Um, the IgM is the same where you have hepatitis right now in the moment, but then they have an ant a surface antigen and a surface antibody. So um, when you're looking at the surface antigen, I say uh, here, you know, I have hepatitis in general. At some point I have fought, you know, hepatitis either it's now or in the past. So it's saying something's going on right now or at some point I actually fought hepatitis. Um, whereas the antibody <clears throat> could be a previous infection or it could be from the vaccination. Because um, remember, A and B both have vaccination. So um, sometimes, like if we're trying to prove that we um, have the um, protection against these, like we've been immunized, um, we can do these lab tests to kind of see if the body has the um, needed protection it needs. But effectively, antigen, that you've actually fought that infection yourself, um, antibody uh, means that you could have fought it yourself or you could have received the vaccine. Um, and then hepatitis C, um, there's the anti-HCV antibody, which means there's a previous or current infection in their body. And so, um, you know, the difference with hepatitis C, you can see here, is that there is no um, one to see if the body is immune, because remember, there's no uh, vaccine for hepatitis C. So these can get really confusing, and yes, there is more labs than this, but these are a lot of the um, bigger ones that we look at um, when we're trying to see about hepatitis.
let's look at treatment for hepatitis. Um, when it goes chronic, um, we'll do antivirals, interferon, and some other you know, immune, mod immune modifiers um, to help support that patient. Um, but as a whole with hepatitis, it's a lot of just supportive care. Um, you know, uh, in that acute phase, we want to, you know, just make sure they get adequate nutrition. Um, they're getting their vitamin supplements, you know, B vitamins and vitamin K, because those are a lot of what are made in the liver. Um, lots of rest, avoid things that are going to irritate the liver. So um, alcohol, um, Tylenol, things like that. Um, we're going to monitor their labs and their liver function to make sure that it's um, not progressing to chronic and kind of just see how their body is handling it as well. Um, and then a lot of the symptom management. So if they're nauseous, we may give them antiemetics. If they're itching because of that excess bilirubin, we can give them antihistamines. Um, but yeah, as you can see here, most of the support, um, the treatment is just supportive um, in managing symptoms. So as a whole, you know, all types of hepatitis can be prevented and um, regular screening, especially for those that are high risk, is so important. But um, some teaching and things that you can do, you know, for hepatitis A, um, proper hygiene, make sure that, you know, because remember that's the fecal oral route, the anus, um, A for anus. So um, we want to remember um, with this one, you want to uh, teach really good hygiene and hand washing. Um, then um, also uh, there's the vaccines usually given at age one and then um, again at, as an adult if you're high risk whether because of your lifestyle or if you're working in healthcare, things like that a lot of times you have to get the hepatitis A. Um, if you're exposed to hepatitis A, um, there's no isolation. Um, they can share a room as long as they're not like very incontinent and um, having like a lot of loose stools and things like that that could be easily spread. Um, and then they're um, usually given if they're acutely exposed to hepatitis A, um, the vaccine. And there's also an immunoglobulin um, that can be given because um, vaccines take a little while to you know build up that immunity in your system. So um, we usually give immunoglobulin Anytime you see Ig, um, it's the um, immunoglobulin just helps to provide a temporary immunity for a few weeks while that vaccine builds up in the system. Um, hepatitis B, um, with, we do a lot of the same stuff: hygiene, um, using gloves uh, when coming into contact with other people's blood, um, not sharing personal items, and um, uh, condom use, of course. Uh, and uh, effectively to um, any of the B and the C, you want to think about dialysis patients. A lot of times um, they, uh, like for hepatitis B, they're going to be um, vaccinated prior to starting dialysis because there's always the risk of, um, because of the machines being used for multiple patients that they could um, get hepatitis B. Even if it might be low, they still kind of preventatively do that. Um, hepatitis B is a, has a, the vaccine. It's a series of three. Um, it starts at birth and it's given uh, the series stops at around 18 months. Um, and then again, adults are given it to um, those high risk adults. So people that are maybe intravenous drug users um, that have um, high risk behaviors like that. Or um, also keep in mind the people who um, are working in healthcare and stuff like that and may come into contact with it. Um, so, uh, you know, with the exposure to Hep B, again, there's no isolation and we give them the hepatitis B vaccine and um, that um, hepatitis B immunoglobulin to kind of build that up in their uh, immune system. So, yeah, so for hepatitis C, you know, we try to encourage them to modify those high risk behaviors. Um, they screen, you know, the organ, blood, and tissue donors to kind of prevent them from, um, you know, passing that on. Um, and good infection control, you know, the whole, again, the not sharing personal items, condom use, and things like that, too. So there's no vaccination for hepatitis C. Um, so if someone's exposed, um, they, again, don't need to be in isolation. Um, and usually for, um, you know, acute exposure to hepatitis C, they don't give any immunoglobulin um, or antivirals. They really just monitor to see if you're going to get hepatitis C, if it's going to become chronic and kind of monitor that liver function. Um, so as a whole, um, you know, we just want to try to support these patients um, in preventing getting hepatitis in the first place, especially those that are high risk. Thank you very much. I hope this was helpful.